WCWM W Slambury 98 took place on the 17th of May in Worcester, Mass. Around 11,500 fans attended the event and the buy rate was similar to Spring Stampede with an estimate of 250,000 to 275,000. Tonight's main event is a curious one, The Outsiders vs Sting in the Giant. The Giant rejoined the NWO after the match was booked so Sting's gonna team up with the enemy. Sting was offered an NWO shirt on Thunder earlier in the week and he didn't say yes but he didn't say no. Also, the commentators say at the beginning of the show that Scott Hall hasn't arrived yet the Slamboree. The semi-main event features Bret Hart vs Randy Savage, we'll talk about how that match came to be a little later on the show. Eric Bischoff has also legitimately challenged Vince McMahon to appear at Slamboree for a fight. Doug Dillinger was outside the arena before the show began looking out for Vince while holding a full access pass for the WWF chairman. Tony Schiavone says that Mr McMahon even has his own dressing room if he decides to show up. Chris Benoit vs Fit Finley is our opening match. Benoit defeated Booker T on Nitro for a shot at the TV Championship so it appears that Booker might be getting phased out of the title picture. Benoit shows he won't be intimidated by chopping Finley after getting shoved and the crowd pops right away. The two then trade holds and Benoit bridges during a test of strength. This gets followed up with the two men trying to pin each other but neither man can steal an early victory. After some mat wrestling the two get up and Benoit performs a smooth hip toss pinning combination. The two then get to their feet, they circle the ring before going at it again, and it's Chris Benoit who takes the lead with a series of knife edge chops followed by a tilt the world backbreaker. Chris then twists out of a Boston Crab attempt, but then he's forced to go out of the ring after a hard clothesline from the television champion. On the outside, Benoit takes a body slam and another clothesline. Inside the ring, Finley brings it down to the mat with some chin abuse and when Benoit tries to come back with more chops, Finley gives him the classic poke in the eye, gets him every time. Finley applies a sleeper as the match slows down a little but it picks right back up when Finley drives Benoit's jaw into the ring apron. Finley then tries to use a steel chair but Chris fights back and Finley takes a shot across the back. Chris then decides to try a dive to the outside but he ends up smacking his head into the steel chair and the audience pops. This was a great spot. Finley thinks he's now got it in the bag, he gets a little more methodical and a little more deliberate as the offense again gets slowed down, but Benoit fights back after dodging a corner charge. He hits two of his three German suplexes before Finley uses the ropes to escape, and Finley's able to grab the ropes when Chris goes for the crippler crossface, but Benoit keeps the advantage and he signals for the headbutt. Just then, Booker T walks down to the ring and Benoit decides to step out to confront his rival. This allows Finley to hit a baseball slide and that's going to be the end of our match. There is a moment of hope for Benoit when he performs an inside cradle but Finley kicks out and Chris gets planted with a tombstone pile driver. Booker walks away as Finley celebrates in the ring, so clearly Benoit and Booker still have some unfinished business. After Brian Adams attacked Rick Steiner on Nitro two weeks ago, Lex Luger challenged either Brian or Scott Steiner to step into the ring at Slamboree. Brian's gonna do the honours tonight then as he takes on the total package in a no-nonsense one-on-one -on -one grudge match. It goes to the outside almost right away where Lex tries to take out Vincent along with Brian. The total package then keeps it on the outside while focusing on Adam's shoulder. He wants to injure Brian the same way Brian injured Rick Steiner on Nitro, in storyline at least. Lex uses the ring post to do as much damage as possible and he keeps Vincent in check too when the NWO's main goon tries to get involved. Back in the ring though, after Lex hits a power slam, a distraction from Vincent pays off and it leads to Brian Adams performing his wonky pile driver. To his credit, Adams continues to sell his shoulder as he starts laying the boots into Lex. 
It goes back to the outside where Brian continues to kick Lex around. Tony Schiavone then gives us an update and he says everyone's unsure if Scott Hall's actually arrived at Slamboree and there's still no word on the arrival of Vince McMahon. Back in the ring, Adams performs a backbreaker and he lands a few leg drops. Luger gets up and the two take each other out with a double clothesline and then the match comes to an end when the two get to their feet and Adams asks Vincent for help. Lex takes out Vincent, Adams rushes in with a clothesline but Lex ducks it and we see the torture rack. The commentators are highly impressed with how Lex locked in his finisher. The total package wins at Slamboree in a very forgettable matchup. On Thunder earlier in the week, a gauntlet match was announced, Goldberg vs The Flock, and if any member of The Flock won, the belt would go back to Raven. Well, here at Slamboree, Saturn says that's not gonna happen. Saturn's gonna face Goldberg himself, and if he wins, he's gonna take the US belt for himself. He says all he hears is, what about me, what about Raven? So Saturn says he's gonna look after himself from now on, and he's gonna become the new US champion. There's nothing Raven can do. Do about it. Interesting stuff, it looks like Saturn's gonna leave the flock after Raven called him his right hand man recently on Nitro. Next up we have the Cruiserweight Battle Royal. The winner of this match faces Cruiserweight Champion Chris Jericho immediately afterwards. Jericho said on Nitro that he was gonna retire the Cruiserweight belt. There's no one who can beat him anymore. He's taken all these trophies from his fallen enemies such as Juventud Guerrero's mask, but he's particularly proud of ending Dean Malenko's career. He's been making fun of Malenko a lot on TV and Dean hasn't been around to defend himself. So JJ Dillon booked this Battle Royal deal for Slamboree and this is it, this could possibly be the last cruiserweight title match on WCW television if Chris can prove again that no one can beat him. He interrupts Dave Panzer by calling him a high voiced dweeb. Jericho says Panzer knows nothing about the fine competitors about to walk down the ramp for this battle royal, so Chris is gonna do the honours himself. Super Kahlo walks out first and Jericho says he has a 1 in 10 chance of winning. Chavo Guerrero used to be a great bartender but it hasn't translated well into his wrestling career. Cyclope used to sell chimichangas on the street. Damien can't afford a mask so he uses paint. Lou Ferrigno lookalike winner El Dandy's here. World welter light featherweight Peza champion El Grio. Next out is the ugliest man in our sport today, Quasi Juice Guerrero. He's gonna rock rock till he drops, rock rock never stop Marty Jannetty. Jericho says to Kidman that he has some calamine lotion in the back for him after the show. The true shooter of WCW Evan Courageous has a 0 out of 10 chance of winning this one. Chris reminds Lenny Lane that he still wants his Loverboy cassette back, a little throwback there to a few months ago when Lenny dressed up like Chris. Psychosis has some hubcaps for sale if anyone in the audience needs them. If Silver King wins 12 more matches, he'll be upgraded to Golden King. <laughs> Chris has never heard of Johnny Swinger so he has nothing to say. And finally, representing Viano's 1 through 62, it's Viano 4. Chris Jericho is easily one of WCW's best promo guys right now. He brings something very different to the table as a heel and I highly recommend you check out his battle royal introductions here, but I also recommend you stick around until the end of the match. On paper, a 15-man cruiserweight battle royal sounds great but you quickly realise that space is very limited and it takes a few eliminations before the guys can start flying around the ring. Chris Jericho watches on backstage as the numbers dwindle down and he was absolutely right, guys like Evan Courageous and Super Colo didn't have much hope of winning this one but the final four, Kidman, Cyclope, Psychosis and Juventud Guerrera were in with a shot. Psychosis eliminated himself in dramatic fashion when missing a corner attack, Hoovy was able to take care of Smackhead Kidman, so it comes down to Cyclope and Juventud Guerrera. The final two guys in the match shake hands and Hoovy decides to eliminate himself and allow Cyclope to win the battle royal. The commentators are confused, as are the fans, but then the place goes absolutely nuts when Cyclope takes off his mask to reveal the man of a thousand holes. Dean Malenko has got himself a shot at the cruiserweight title and it's payback time for Chris Jericho, the man who's been ripping Dean apart for months. Chris can't believe it but he has no choice, Dean launches an attack and the crowd are still popping as the match gets underway. The sustained pop continues as Dean gets vicious in the corner with a ton of stomps and even watching this at home all these years later can still get you very excited. This was absolutely phenomenal. 
Dean wrecks Jericho before delivering a back body drop and a drop kick. Chris tries to block a suplex and a waist lock, but Malenko punches the back of Jericho's head over and over before Chris gets kicked to the outside. Dean does a little damage on the outside and back in the ring Chris thinks he's got an advantage, but Dean blocks a chop and Malenko keeps the pressure on as the crowd chants Jericho sucks. A stun gun finally puts Dean on the mat. He takes a running senton and a drop kick while still on the canvas. He then takes a vertical suplex and Chris tries his cocky one foot pin, but Dean stays in it. He even survives a lion salt. Multiple standing switches lead to Dean taking a backbreaker. Chris goes for a lion tamer, but Dean counters and Chris makes it to the bottom rope. Jericho performs a diving back elbow and he very nearly wins the match, but it's not over yet. So Jericho sets Dean on the top rope, he's looking for a hurricane rana. Dean fights out with his super gut buster and that's it all over. Dean locks in the Texas Cloverleaf and Dean becomes the new cruiserweight champion. Dean looks up and he says, hey dad this one's for you as the audience continue to cheer. And what we end up with here is a show stealing performance and a real memorable moment in WCW history. How will Jericho respond to this? <laughs> well you gotta keep watching Nitro. WCW have a Vinnie Mac cam set up outside and it spots a white limo pulling up to the arena. Doug Dillinger is taking a break from ruining Alex Wright's life tonight and he's still outside looking for Vince McMahon. So he approaches the limousine before speaking to another security guard. Tony Schiavone says the limo likely doesn't have Vince McMahon inside, but they really missed an opportunity here didn't they? They should have had Alex Wright pop out and start dancing, Doug would then have to call the boys in to put the big brothers back in the limousine. Next we, <laughs> next we have the Barwee deathmatch, Barwee, Barwee, yeah I can't say it. It's an enclosed steel cage match where the loser won't be able to answer a 10 count. Diamond Dallas Page vs Raven On Nitro, Raven was given his own riot squad by JJ Dillon because of a certain fan constantly attacking the flock and himself, and the riot squad is here at Slamboree as Raven makes his way down to the ring. The two get in the cage, the referee asks for the bell, and it starts with Raven getting his head rocked on the top turnbuckle 10 times. Raven gets up and he shoves Dallas into a trash can filled with weapons that's been placed on the top turnbuckle, and this happens again on the other side of the ring before Raven throws DDP into a cage panel. After throwing DDP into a trash can again, Raven decides to see what's inside and there's a lot of toys here. The other trash can gets emptied and we can see a VCR, but Raven wants the bull rope. DDP doesn't give his opponent a chance though, Dallas lands a discus clothesline before choking Raven with the bull rope, he sends him into the side of the steel cage, and then Dallas gets Raven hung up by using the bull rope and the roof of the steel cage. Spots you won't find too often in modern wrestling right here. DDP then breaks the VCR over Raven's head and he lets the referee begin a count. The ref gets the 7 before Raven kicks Page into the trash can and then Raven hits Dallas with that same can across the back. Raven lets Billy Silverman count in between shots but Dallas keeps getting back up. A shot with a baking tray makes a loud noise around the arena and Raven liked it so much that he attacks Page again while he's on the mat. Raven then sets up a steel chair for his signature drop toe hold, but Dallas fights back and the chair doesn't get used. Instead, Raven locks in a sleeper and this leads to a referee bump in the corner. Gonna be honest, I was expecting a bit more wrestling in this one. So far, it's been all weapon based, and there's nothing wrong with that by the way, it's just a bit of a letdown because we know how good these two are when competing against each other under more normal circumstances. The Red Squad stand by as Raven tries another sleeper. DDP gets out with a jawbreaker, and then DDP hits Raven with the drop toe hold. Still, though, there's no referee to make the 10 count. The flock then show up and Big Reese's Pieces shoves the Riot Squad away. Riggs breaks the lock with a pair of bolt cutters, but then Van Hammer shows up from under the ring. Hammer attacks Reese, Sick Boy and Riggs with a giant stop sign. He then handcuffs Reese to the guardrail so the Yeti can't interfere, but then members of the Riot Squad jump in and they start attacking Dallas. Turns out it's actually Smackhead Kidman and Horace Boulder lending a hand here, but they're no match for DDP. Both guys take diamond cutters and check out the one that Kidman took, so good. 
Both Raven and DDP then make conscious efforts to end the match. Raven hits Paige with a fire extinguisher but Paige gets back up. Raven then hits Dallas with a diamond cutter but DDP stays in it. Raven swings a chair, DDP hits the diamond cutter and that's it all over. Paige gets to his feet before Raven so Dallas wins this match. DDP gets out of the ring and he celebrates with the audience and then a member of the riot squad starts handcuffing flock members to the cage. Everyone gets neutralized including Raven and then this rogue rat guy picks up a steel chair. Before swinging it he takes his helmet off and it's Mortis. Mortis then takes his mask off, he picks the chair back up and Raven takes a chair shot right to the head before Mortis or Chris Canyon leaves the ring. It was still a pretty entertaining match but I'd take their spring stampede match over this or even the uncensored triple threat match. The security team have been given a printout with Steve Austin, Vince McMahon and D-Generation X photos on the page. The boys are on high alert for Vince's arrival or a potential WWF invasion. We see the arena security cameras but no one's arrived yet. Keep in mind that Eric Bischoff flat out said on Thunder that Vince McMahon won't be at Slambury after reading out an official letter sent by WWF lawyer Jerry McDivitt. But WCW are gonna milk this one for all it's worth. Next up we had Ultimo Dragon vs Eddie Guerrero and instead of the match being all about both guys excellent in ring work it's centered around Chavo Guerrero. Eddie's been giving his nephew a hard time for a few months now and Dragon's been sympathetic towards Chavo. So it was announced on Thunder that if Dragon can beat Eddie tonight then Chavo will get his freedom and he can break away from Uncle Eddie. Dragon got the better of Eddie twice after the opening bell with an arm drag and a snap mare counter. Eddie of course complained about hair pulling. It goes to the map where we see some seriously impressive monkey flip counters and when Dragon goes for the kick combo Eddie rolls out of the way. Dragon gets drop kicked before Eddie lays the boots in and Dragon goes for his corner headstand but he messes it up, something we aren't used to seeing. He does manage to hit that kick combo though and Eddie goes to the outside. Guerrero walks right past Chavo as he tries to get it together, he gets back in the ring to resume the match and the audience have started cheering for a big boy in the audience who just removed his t-shirt. Yeah. Chavo tries to will Dragon back into the match after Eddie twists his foot on his face but it doesn't work. Dragon takes a clothesline, a suplex and worst of all a chin lock and then Eddie throws his opponent out of the ring where Dragon gets choked with some cable. Back in the ring Eddie gets his ball smashed on the top rope and when Eddie falls back out of the ring Dragon's able to perform the Asai moonsault. Chavo tries to cool down his uncle's opponent and when the two get back inside Dragon performs a tilt the world spinning rack backbreaker or at least I think that's what it was. Whatever the case it looked good. A moonsault fails to put Eddie away and Eddie counters a dragon stunner with a tornado DDT. He fails to hit dragon with his frog splash but dragon also fails to pin Eddie with a magistral cradle. It comes to an end when Eddie counters the dragon sleeper with a dragon sleeper of his own. Chavo gets involved when Eddie uses the ropes for leverage and this leads to Eddie paintbrushing his nephew. Dragon then inadvertently hits Chavo, Eddie takes advantage with a brain buster, he then hits his frog splash and Eddie wins. Chavo's livid, he throws Eddie in the corner and we think he's about to fight Uncle Eddie but Chavo instead attacks Ultimo Dragon. Chavo has totally snapped. This was his only shot to leave Eddie but that opportunity is now out the window. Eddie slaps Chavo before giving his nephew a free shot but Chavo won't do it. So Eddie stands up, he tells his nephew to kiss him on the cheek, Chavo ends up doing it and Eddie laughs afterwards. Vince McMahon, the reason for the ratings, has his own dressing room in the back, we get a look at it before our next match. The reason for the ratings name came from Jerry McDivitt's letter by the way. Next we have Goldberg vs Saturn, as mentioned this was supposed to be a gauntlet match but it's been changed to a standard one on one contest, the US title is on the line. Saturn comes out first followed by Goldberg and this is a match that happened a lot at house shows leading up to Slamboree so the two should have this one pretty fine tuned. Goldberg Goldberg scores first with a headlock takeover, Saturn fights back but a clothesline puts the challenger on the mat. 
Goldberg then performs his Gorilla Press Power Slam and this gets a great reaction from the audience. And we see another Gorilla Press Slam from the US champ immediately afterwards. Saturn makes Goldberg follow him on the outside and this gives Perry the advantage back in the ring. A spinning back kick puts Saturn down again though but he replies with a leg sweep. Saturn then makes the mistake of slapping Goldberg around while on the mat and this leads to the champ throwing the challenger into the corner. Perry rolls out of the ring after taking a kick in and Goldberg stays on his opponent with a punch to the head. Goldberg ends up punching the ring post though by accident when Saturn moves out of the way. Perry lines up an apron drop kick and Goldberg falls into the cameraman. Back in the ring Perry pulls off a spinning wheel kick from the top rope but Goldberg stays in it. Saturn then applies a chin lock and Goldberg stands up while in the hold. No chin lock can stop Billy Boy. Goldberg then counters a sleeper with a belly to belly suplex but Perry comes back with a swinging neck breaker. Saturn delivers an exploder suplex next before bringing a chair into the ring. A super kick knocks Goldberg in the corner and this allows Saturn to use the chair to hit a springboard drop kick. He tries once again to use the chair as a springboard but he gets caught out with a spear. We see the jackhammer and Goldberg retains the United States Championship. Not a great match honestly but the spear looked pretty good. Since Monday Nitro Goldberg defeated Sick Boy on Thunder, he then beat Saturn twice at house shows on the 15th and 16th of May and Yuji Nagata fell to Goldberg on WCW Saturday night. The real win streak currently stands at 83-0. Michael Buffer introduces Eric Bischoff to the ring. Fans don't know what to expect here and Tony Schiavone says, let's see what happens. Eric's walking down for a match against Vince McMahon but as mentioned on Thunder, Vince isn't going to appear tonight. Bischoff takes his jacket off, he warms up in the ring. Buffer introduces Mr. Vincent K. McMahon but no one walks out. Buffer again introduces McMahon, there's no sign of Vinnie Mac, so Bischoff asks the referee what are we going to do about this. Mickey J says he'll count Vince McMahon out and Eric Bischoff thinks the whole crowd should do it. The bell rings, Eric leads a 10 count and there you go, Buffer says Bischoff has won the match via forfeit and disqualification. Tony Schiavone says Eric wins via count out and no show. Whatever the case, it wasn't a good look for Eric at all was it? It would have been very intriguing to see McMahon walk down the ramp at a WCW event and it would have been very historic, but Vince didn't see any benefit in showing up. Apparently though, he did think about showing up at Slambury. If you want to learn more about this, I covered the whole thing in a separate video a while back. Have a look on the channel and you can get more info regarding this challenge at Slambury. Bret Hart takes on Randy Savage next and this is our semi main event. Bret Hart cost Randy Savage the world heavyweight title the night after Spring Stampede and it sounded like Bret had sided with Hollywood Hogan in the black and white NWO, although he's yet to flat out say it. You kinda get the impression that Bret has an ulterior motive in all this but that doesn't stop the macho man wanting to get revenge for what Bret did to him. Things were heating up between the two with attacks at the end of Nitro and Bret Hart saying that Randy has always been hiding from the hitman. So Roddy Piper's gonna officiate this one and Piper wants both men to tear each other apart. Piper couldn't care less about Brett or Savage. Brett comes out first and he's introduced by Michael Buffer as just Brett. Brett. Piper makes his way to the ring, Savage makes his entrance and it looks like Brett's a little afraid to step inside the ropes with the macho man. Brett stalls a lot and Piper gets annoyed so the hot rod throws Brett into the ring and he tells the men to hurry up and fight. The two build up a little anticipation, they lock horns in the middle of the ring and Savage starts it off with an eye rake and an elbow to the head. Brett immediately replies with strikes and he's focusing on the back in the midsection here. Brett then chokes Randy in the corner, Piper begins a 5 count and this goes against what Piper said on Nitro. He said neither man should complain about cheating and he expects both men to give as good as they they get, so why he's threatening to disqualify Brett makes no sense. He does the exact same when Savage chokes Brett in the corner with his boot and Savage isn't happy when Piper begins another 5 count moments later. A headbutt floors Savage and Brett follows up with a leg drop. Savage ends up on the apron and Brett performs a smooth suplex to bring Savage back in. Randy has to roll out of the ring again after another hitman headbutt to the midsection and Brett decides to go out and get a little vicious. He throws Randy into the ring post before trying to use the steel steps. Brett misses his target and Randy's able to turn it around. 
The two then end up fighting in the crowd after Brett throws Savage over the guardrail and it's a miserable viewing experience for those watching at home. You can hardly see anything at all here because the production guys didn't send a cameraman into the audience. Eventually they come back and it's Savage who's taking control. Brett gets body slammed on the outside and things aren't looking too good for the hitman. So Brett has no choice but to target that injured knee of Randy's and we get some classic hitman offense here. Everything's targeted right at the injured body part and it's not only a matter of time before the inevitable happens. Brett shouts he's the best there is, the best there was and the best there ever will be as he destroys Macho. He takes time in between offense to also remind fans at home that he's the best and Savage is gonna try to get out of the ring for a moment but Brett brings him right back in for a Russian leg sweep. Randy tries to fight back but he gets his head kicked in. Brett performs a pie driver and he covers Randy while raising his arm in the air. Randy kicks out. Brett argues with Piper and the fans. He then plants Macho with a DDT but Randy kicks out thanks to Brett wasting time and talking smack to fans at ringside. Hart then performs a backbreaker but he misses a second rope elbow drop. Randy hops on one leg as he sets Brett up for a suplex and he nails it. Somehow Randy climbs upstairs and he's able to pull off his signature elbow drop. That should be it all over. Unfortunately the Macho Man's been beaten up too badly and he takes too long to cover the hit man. Brett kicks out, he's able to scoop the Macho Man's legs and Brett locks in the sharpshooter. Miss Elizabeth then runs down but Savage counters the sharpshooter with his very own version of the move. Liz gets in the ring and she shoves Piper, she wants Roddy to throw the match out but this interference does more harm than good. Ok so follow along. Brett low blows Savage and he then punches Roddy Piper in the back of the head. Savage punches Brett and Randy notices that Brett has those brass knucks that don't look like brass knucks but we'll call them brass knucks anyway. Randy takes the weapon and he gets ready to clock Brett. The hitman begs for mercy but then Hollywood Hogan shows up and he swipes the macho man's leg. Randy then gets his knee wrapped around the ring post and Brett's then able to apply the sharpshooter. Roddy notices that Randy's got the brass knucks so he thinks macho hit him from behind earlier on. Long. And at that very moment, the Macho Man gives it up and Bret Hart defeats Randy Savage at Slamboree 1998. Piper has no issues raising Bret's hand, seeing as he thinks Savage is the one who hit him. Bret celebrates, he spits on the Macho Man, and the commentators call this a big win for both Bret Hart and NWO Hollywood. Was it a good match? I thought it was interesting seeing Brett heal it up in a WCW ring seeing as his previous matches were kind of vanilla but I don't think it's what anyone would call a great wrestling match. During the bout Tony Schiavone announced that Scott Hall had arrived at the arena so the main event's going to happen as advertised. The Outsiders vs The Giant and Sting is our main event and the build up has been messy. The Giant joined the NWO this past week on Nitro but the match is still going ahead, meaning a WCW guy is teaming up with an NWO black and white guy. On Thunder, Sting didn't turn down nor accept an invitation to join the New World Order so you've got that interesting and unconventional dynamic going on over on one side of the ring. On the other side we have the return of Scott Hall. The last time we saw Scott on WCW WTV, there was a lot more harmony within the NWO, but now things have drastically changed. Kevin Nash is leading his own version of the New World Order, the Wolfpack, so Scott's decided to come back and join his friend in creating this new iteration of the group who changed WCW forever. The Wolfpack are getting the babyface treatment, but Sting is also one of WCW's biggest babyfaces right now. This leaves the giant as the one and only true bad guy in all this, even though he only turned heel a week ago. So <laughs> yeah, that's our main event guys, it's not great is it? The tag team titles are on the line. The outsiders come out first and the crowd roars when Scott walks out alongside Dusty and Big Sexy. This was Scott's second return from rehab while in WCW and even though Scott had issues, he was still welcomed back with open arms by fans of World Championship Wrestling. It's just a shame things didn't work out in the end though. He gets in the ring, he says, we missed you too and then he conducts the survey. The crowd say they're here to see the NWO and they even join in when Scott says one more for the good guys. The giant then comes out followed by the stinger. The big man seems confident as he talks to Sting like the icon's his best buddy but Sting doesn't look like he wants to communicate with his partner. The dust settles in the arena and fans get ready to see the Slamboree 1998 main event. 
We start with the bad guy and the stinger. Scott marks his return by throwing a toothpick in the icon's face while Sting tells Scott to suck it. Paul softens up the shoulder after performing a wrist lock and Sting gets out of a hammer lock with a back elbow. The two counter each other's hip toss attempts and Scott pulls off a choke slam and Hall decides to mock the giant after performing the move. Sting takes advantage and he plants Scott's face on the mat. Hall takes an inverted atomic drop next that he sells wonderfully and things aren't looking too good when Hall takes two stinger splashes, one to the back and one to the chest. A deathlock attempt gets stopped when Nash gets in the ring. Sting's doing just fine taking on both outsiders but the Jan comes in to headbutt Nash and this leads to the Wolfpack having a team meeting on the outside. Scott gets back in the ring and we get a lot of time wasting here. Sting ends up tagging in the giant. We get more time wasting as Scott tries to intimidate the big man. And then Scott decides to tag in Kevin Nash and again we get more time wasting. You can't really complain about it because the crowd are cheering along and they're clapping their hands but it's something that happens frequently in WCW main events. Nash and Jant go at it and Jant gets rocked. Nash then goes for the jackknife but Jant overpowers Big Sexy and it goes to the corner. Nash stays in control here for a moment. He hits a corner clothesline but Giant replies with one of his own. Nash then takes a standing sidekick from the Giant and even Mike Tanay mentions here that fans don't know how to respond to the Giant. Nash gets squashed in the corner and Giant sinks his knee into Nash's chest while pulling Kevin's hair. The crowd chant let's go Wolfpack as Sting tags in. The Stinger gets distracted by Hall and this leads to Nash performing a big boot on the icon. Scott comes in and he performs the fallaway slam. This gets a good reaction. Sting gets floored again with a punch to the face before Nash comes back in momentarily and Sting's gonna stay dazed here as Nash and Hall cut off the ring and Sting takes a beating. Quick tags keep the outsiders in control. The Wolfpack guys are working way better as a team here as Sting finds himself in an abdominal stretch. Big Sexy comes in to deliver his sidewalk slam before locking in a bear hug and now the Giants very eager to tag back in. Sting fights out. He takes out Hall before trying to jump over Nash to make the tag. The Giant finally comes back in and he wrecks Nash in the corner. Now the outsiders have completely lost their advantage. Nash gets body slammed. He then takes a leg drop from the Giant. The big man then decides to climb upstairs and the crowd get on their feet to see what's going to happen. The giant misses a splash though. Both men are down. Dusty Rhodes leaves a tag team belt in the ring and just as Nash gets to his feet, the American Dream distracts the referee. Nash goes for the jackknife and in a move that sucks the life out of fans in attendance, Scott Hall hits Kevin Nash with that tag team belt. Hall just betrayed his best friend. Jan pins Kevin Nash, the commentators are in shock, Sting's in shock, and the fans are totally confused by Hall's actions. Hall and Dusty Rhodes embrace the giant. Giant and Hall tell Sting to get in the ring and celebrate his big title win, but Sting's in absolutely no mood. He can't believe what's going on. The show ends and fans now assume that Scott Hall and Dusty Rhodes have joined NW Hollywood, and you can sense a whole lot of genuine disappointment in the arena as the show fades to black. I thought Spring Stampede was better than Slambery, but you will get a bit more out of this pay-per-view if you've been following along on Nitro and Thunder. Most matches on here have been built up quite a bit on TV and you really need to understand what's going on with everyone involved before the bell rings. Going into this one not knowing where everyone's at and just watching it randomly without knowing the storylines is gonna hurt your viewing experience. For example, if you didn't watch Jericho rip into Dean Malenko since Uncensored then that moment when Dean takes the mask off won't mean half as much. Or maybe you won't understand why Mortis showed up or why Chavo was so angry when Eddie defeated Ultimo Dragon. The commentators explain things of course but they can't explain weeks or even months of build up during entrances alone. That being said, the action in the ring was just okay. Malenko and Jericho stole the show but on the flip side of that you maybe expect a little more from Savage vs Hard or DDP versus Raven. And then you have that crowd reaction to Scott Hall at the very end. It didn't feel like heat, it really felt like the fans got annoyed at yet another WCW swerve. Anyway, that's going to do it for today. Join me on Thursday for Reliving the War and we'll see what's next for WCW, NW Hollywood and NW Wolfpack. Thanks for watching guys and take care.